All right. Hey, a couple things before we get into the Word. Those were some ugly sweaters. I mean, they were, there was one in the first service I wish you could have seen. It was vile. I, I, and right now, it's kind of hard on my eyes. I have a, a stigma, and some of the colors out there are starting to get to me. But um, a couple things before we get into the Word. Uh, our speakers for the sanctuary have arrived. They are, yes, they are up in the studio there's 20-something boxes. It's just a huge amount of stuff. So it's here. The electrician has come, and they're starting to put all the power in for those. So that, this old system that sounds like not good will, uh, will be replaced with a top-of-the-line serious system. I've told you before, we got an incredible deal. It's probably a $300,000 set of speakers, and uh, we, we got an incredible deal. And so... Then we met with a couple of guys who were kind of helping us design our sanctuary colors, foyer, the way we're going to kind of look. So we met with them last week, and we're we're pumped. This place is going to look so cool. Colors, uh, carpet, chairs, paint, some stuff we're going to do in this backdrop. So if maybe you're coming to the end of the year and you're like, man, there's some money I have to give away for a tax (laughs) write-off. And I don't talk about money. If you come here a lot, you know I'm not always, I don't ask for money a lot because I don't like to swing that bat very much because then it makes people feel like, man, all the church want is uh, our money, and that's not true. But it does take the family to build the house, right? And so maybe you're just like, yeah, you know what? I- I've got that extra 500 grand sitting there, and <laughs> I'm just going to... I'm just going to sign, write a check, and you know, it's cool. I'm going to give it to the church. Um, But no, seriously, just any little bit will help. We've already got the speakers paid for. We saved for about a year and eight months, a year and six months, and the speaker system, um, almost $200,000 is all covered and paid for. So we're just asking now for help with chairs and carpet. And so we'll look pretty. So we look, you know, good. I believe in it looking right because people come in here. And I want them to go like, wow, this place is comfortable, and they care. It will look 10 times better than it does right now. It's going to look amazing. So come on, think about it, pray about it. All right, open your Bibles, Luke chapter 2. We're going to get into the message today. We're in a new series entitled, A Revolution is Born. How many know there's lots of revolutionary things in the world today? Before I get into it, though, let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to help me. Father, I ask you for your help this morning. That, Holy Spirit, you would come and anoint my mouth to speak the word of God and that you would open our hearts to hear it. And I pray that your peace would settle on this place in a great way. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of my message today is A Not-So-Silent Night is the title of my message in Revolution is Born. How many of you out there have one of these? How many of you out there have one of these? Raise it up, yeah. You know, Steve Jobs was revolutionary in the sense that he revolutionized the way that you and I communicate with each other, emails, texts. We can watch movies now. We do all this great stuff. And you know what's crazy is the iPhone 6 is what I'm holding. And I had the, the iPhone 5S, I believe, is what it was. I can't keep up with all the S's and the 5's and the points. But, and I thought to myself, I'm not going to get that phone when it comes out. It's stupid. It's just... It's, a, it's, a, it's an iPhone 5 with, with, you know, a little bigger screen. And so I went and looked at it, and I, and I got it, and um, I decided that I wanted it. <laughs> and, I, and I thought to myself, you know, this guy was revolution. In the, he created a revolution in the sense of how we communicate, but he can't revolutionize somebody's heart. You can own the latest iPad and the greatest phones and all the gadgets. By the way, I love the gadgets. I'm way into them. Just ask my wife. I love that stuff. But this can't change my heart. It's caused so, there's only one person in all of history that has caused such a revolution that literally time in history is marked by him. Buddha did not mark time. Hare Krishna did did not mark time. But Jesus coming and dying, they literally marked it in history. And that's the way that we now relate to one another, right? After death, before uh, B.C., uh, A.D., that's how we relate with things. And so Jesus came, this awesome little baby, slipped it right by the enemy. The enemy was looking, and everybody was looking for Jesus, the Messiah, to come and be like... um, Ticker take parade, a band playing when he came in, and a big, you know, golden uh, uh, bassinet. And Jesus came through a little girl, virgin birth, and and into an obscure place where where the enemy and nobody knew that it was even happening. 
The, the enemy got sucker punched because he was thinking it was going to come another way. And this little tiny baby revolutionized the entire world, even still to this day, more than anybody that's ever lived. And so we're going to get into this today, and we're going to look at three sets of people that are in this story. And so if you have your Bible, go to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all should be registered. And the census first took place with uh, Quirinius, who's governing Syria, who was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So watch this. No matter where you lived in that area, you had to go back to your hometown where you were born to be registered. That's, that's what was going on. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. Because he was of the house of the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. So let's pause so we understand something. Scholars kind of, kind of debate about where was Jesus really born? Was he born in a barn? Because my mom and dad used to say that to me, right? I'd leave the door open. Hey, were you born in a barn? How many of you ever had that? The little kid, I never say that to my son. I, I should, it's a perfect one. And so was Jesus born in a barn and truly laid in a manger, which was a trough that, uh, that animals ate out of? Well, scholars argue this all the time. Well, he was born in a barn and he was laid in a manger where, where, where uh, uh, you know, animals eat from. No, he was born in a cave where animals got out of the, you know, the weather. And so here's, here's the thing. Who cares? I don't care. Like, I see all these, these I'm reading all this stuff about stuff, and I'm going, people waste so much time and energy on, was he born in a trough? Was he born in a barn? Was he born in a cave? I don't know. He was born. I don't know where he was born at, but I know this that he was born and he came. So let's not get all, you know, people want to email me and talk about this. I get it, I get it. Cool, he was born in a barn, sweet. You believe that? Sweet. He was born in a cave? Cool, I'm down. I'm good. It doesn't change uh, what he did. He came in the flesh for you and me, yeah? Come on, a little more, yeah. <laughs> verse, verse eight, now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which uh, will be to all people. How many people? All people. Not just the people group, but all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign to you that you will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. So I'm going to say that he was in a manger I don't know if he was in a cave or in a barn, but he was in a manger. Here we go, verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now, when they had seen him... They made widely known uh, the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled and, and, uh, at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying God. Awesome story, but we're going to look at three sets of, uh, of people real quick. Let's look at, at Mary and Joseph uh, real quick. Hang on a second. Here we go. Mary and Joseph. Come on now. iPhone, Yosemite, whatever messing up stuff. Uh, Mary and Joseph. So why, why did they go, why did, why did Mary and Joseph go from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Because they were going to fulfill Scripture, right? They were going to fulfill Scripture. In the Old Testament, it was prophesied that Jesus would come and he would be out of Nazareth, but he would be born in Bethlehem. So there he is. He's born in Bethlehem, and he's fulfilling Scripture. Could you imagine leaving Nazareth to go to Bethlehem? You're probably thinking, sweet Mary, we get to leave the place where everyone knows that you are claiming that you were pregnant by the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that that was tough? Here's Mary, a teenager. She's in her house, and an angel of the Lord comes to her and says, you're going to be pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
and you're going to have a child, the Son of God, and you're 15 years old, and you're going, what? And then you get pregnant, and you're, you try to hide it, and your husband-to-be finds out. He wants to just call it off, and an angel appears to him, and everyone in town was like, yeah, right, Mary, you were born. You're pregnant with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right, floozy. That's what people were thinking. See, we read the Bible and we, we, we don't put ourselves in that situation, 15 years old and pregnant, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and she was mocked probably a lot. By the way, the virgin birth is mocked still to this day. That same spirit is here. I watch the History Channel and they'll have a, a professor on there who's like, it's impossible for a, a virgin to get pregnant. And you go like this. Yeah, it, it's why it's, it's God doing it. See, God isn't bound to time and space. God isn't bound to our little minds. And so the Holy Spirit came upon her, and she was pregnant with the Son of God. And he's like, yeah. she was like, yes, let's go to Bethlehem. Get me out of here. And they go to Bethlehem, and they're registered, and it literally, because Scripture says that, that Joseph was of the line of David, he had to go to that time in that perfect place, and that's where Jesus was born. Could you imagine being, how, how much that revolutionized Mary and Joseph in their hearts, it revolutionized their life? What great change when Mary, 15, do you think it revolutionized her life when she found out she was pregnant and the angel said it's the son of God? Could you imagine raising God? <laughs> think about it for a sec. You're raising God. He's in your house. He's walking around, nine years old, he's late from, for back from school, and you're like, hey, you're late. And he's like, I'm never late. <laughs> My timing is perfect, right? Do you think you're God's gift to everybody or what? Yeah, I do. <clears throat> Bethlehem means, listen to this, Bethlehem means house of bread. That's what Bethlehem means. What a fitting place, John uh, chapter 6, verse 35, says that Jesus, the bread of life, came down from heaven. So it was fitting for Jesus to be born in a place that is named house of bread. What is that? Substance, life. Jesus came down from heaven, the bread of heaven, and he became, and he gives us every day bread to eat, and he, he sustains our life. So Mary and Joseph are blown away, right? They're going, wow, this is unbelievable. And then the angels, let's talk about the angels for a second. In the Bible, so the angels, think about this, they're in heaven in Genesis chapter 1. Let's back it all the way up to Genesis chapter 1. And the Bible says in John chapter 1, read it when you go home today, that Jesus, the word of God, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. And the Bible says in John 1 that nothing was made that's made without him. He was the great builder, the craftsman. And so the angels are in heaven watching Jesus in Genesis chapter 1 going, let there be light. And so, poof. And people go, well, the earth is 40 billion years old. And I go, again, again, I don't care. People get so caught up in, was it 40 billion years old? Is it 10,000 years old? Is it 20,000 years old? I don't know. But I know this, that when God spoke, things happened. And life came to a planet. And man, the angels were like, wow, Jesus is amazing. And then all of a sudden, fast forward. You're in the choir. You're one of the angels. Some angel comes and grabs you. You're, there's 25, 30, 40, I don't know, a host of angels. And they're like, look, we got 2,000 years to get ready for this song we're about to sing. So, Bob, you're in charge of the choir, and here's the words. Watch. I'm going to say him again in Scripture. Here's the word. And suddenly there was with them an angel, the angel and a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God, saying, here's the words they had to learn. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So they practice, you know, and this isn't in the Bible. Somebody don't email me about this. I know it's not in the Bible. I'm just having fun with the story. So the angels are there, and they're practicing. You know what I mean? And these angels are like, what are we singing this for? Two lines. And then all of a sudden, one day the Lord comes and says, uh, uh, God the Father says, hey, guys, it's time for you to go. I've been waiting to do this since the beginning of time. Here's your GPS. Go find the shepherds. They're out in the field. And the angels thought, wait, aren't we going to a big tabernacle? Aren't we going to the temple? Aren't we going to stand before all those Pharisees dressed in all their robe and feeling good? And the, and the Lord's like, no, no, no. You're going to go to shepherds. And they're like, well, shepherds are outcasts. 
in society? Why would we go to shepherds? Why don't we go to somebody super important? Because in the Lord doing that and God sending those angels to sing for them, it was the sign of what Jesus would do. He would call the obscure and those that are down and out and those that are broken and those that are in bondage and those whom society has pushed off as no good. Jesus comes to them and sings over them. Watch. Peace. Goodwill. God has a plan for your life that's powerful. Think about it. Those angels show up, and they're like, boom, lights on, and there's sheep, and there's shepherds, and the shepherds are just another mindless night of doing what they do, and the angel comes. Hey, there's a, there's, the Savior has been born tonight. He's for all. He's, died. He, he's come for all. And could you imagine, every time an angel shows up in Scripture, I say this to you a lot, but it's true. Every time an angel shows up in Scripture, what, what happens? People get afraid every time an angel shows up. Don't be afraid. Could you imagine what it would be like? I mean, an angel shows up and you're like, wow. Matter of fact, people want to bow down and worship them. And the angels are always like, no, 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 no. Wait till you see Jesus. If I'm dropping you to your knees, wait till you see Jesus. We're not to be worshiped. And then the angel comes and he declares to them a message. And then the heavenly host, all right, guys, you're on. Hit it. They clear their throats. They've been waiting for, for, for since the beginning of time to bring this message, watch this, to a bunch of people whom society has cast out. And I hate to say this, but I believe this, that part of the problem in the church today, and I'm guilty of it, and the Lord has to convict me and help me, but I'm guilty of believing that I'm actually righteous in my own ways now, that I'm actually good, and then I have to back up the, 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 the history, the timeline a little bit and look back at when I was just a ninth grade boy with long hair and doing things I shouldn't be doing and feeling completely broken and completely lost. And Jesus came to me in that moment when I could offer him nothing and he saved me. And guys, we need to be struck again with the wonder of Jesus. It wasn't a silent night when Jesus was born. Matter of fact, the loudest thing had been sung that night. That choir, I love this, Jesus was born, boom. And the first thing that happens, watch, is worship. The angels sing his song. The angel proclaims, and the shepherds go and find him and worship him. Jesus was worshiped from the moment he, he came to this earth. You know why? Because the angels were in heaven going, this is unbelievable. The, the word of God has become, the word literally has become a speechless little baby. We don't know what to think of this. The Bible says that angels watch you and I, and they, they're, they're, they're amazed at what's going on. They're like, how are they, what's going on? The son of God, watch. Picture this, this blew my mind. I, I, I like to really think about these things and after I read them. Watch, Jesus Genesis 1 God who created all things. The shepherds come and they're staring God in the face. They're staring their Savior in the face. Could you imagine that moment? I mean, here they are. There's Jesus. It's like this is Jesus. And the angels, you can't see them at this point. They're, they're invisible, but they're watching what's going on. They go, we just sang this announcement and we don't even really fully understand it. Let's go check it out. And they're like, do they realize who they're standing in front of? Because in heaven, Jesus was the center of power. And in earth, when he came to earth, he was a helpless little baby. And I say it all the time. People are real happy with Jesus in the manger, aren't they? Oh, cute little baby, moo, moo, moo. Why? Because babies can't talk. Babies can't tell you what to do. Well, they can with crying and stuff. But you know, everyone's okay with Jesus in the manger. Just, hey, 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 yeah, keep him there. But he grew up. And guys, through a violent war, he bought our life. Through an act of massive courage, he bought our freedom at the cross. That little baby, the speechless word of God, the angels are like, man, he created all things and he's laying. I don't even understand what's happening right now. The angels, their minds were blown. And guess what? They still are. Did you know that angels can't receive grace? Think about that for a sec. 
I was, when I was studying this, I thought, you know, angels can't experience what you and I are experiencing. Jesus came and died for mankind. He died so that we could be born again. Angels can't experience that. Only we get to experience that. So watch this. They're proclaiming something that you and I get to experience. They didn't even, they were like, wow, okay, we're going to sing this song, but it's beyond us a little bit. And then they see a little freshman kid get down on his knees and give his heart to Jesus and, then, and, and watch the Lord over years transform and change and do something in there. And they're in awe of God, not of me, of course. They're like, you chose him? You ever feel that way? See, a lot of us feel that way. Well, God would never use me like that because I'm not good enough. You're right, neither am I. So get over yourself and give yourself to Jesus and start doing what he's asked you to do. And quit arguing with him all the time. You know what that is, really? That's just pride. That's just false pride. Oh, I can't do anything for God because I'm so broken. You're right, you're, you're broken. Get over yourself, surrender to Jesus, and start serving the Lord. Amen? Because he'll do it. If, we're, if, if any of us are up here uh, because we're so great and we've achieved something, uh, we are deceived because the Lord is the one who's done this. Okay, look at this. Uh, the shepherds. Let's talk about the shepherds for just a minute. The first Christmas rush was the shepherds rushing to go see Jesus. How many of you, uh, the day after Thanksgiving, went to the mall? Man, I know, there's not a lot of people with their hands raised because they're smart. <laughs> I went to the mall the day after Thanksgiving with my son because he wanted to return something. I said, well, let's go, buddy. And I like, listen, I like people. I love crowds. So it kind of energizes me when I go to the mall. And it's kind of it's scary when I go to the mall and there's only like a few people. I wonder what bad thing is about to happen, that, that, right? So there's all these people that I walk in and it's just wall to wall people. And I'm like, this is awesome, Aaron. Let's go down on the lower level and get with the, the people, the crowd. And so we're walking through there and I'm thinking to myself, these people are rushing to get 5% off <laughs> of, a, of an item that was probably marked up way high in the first place. And I'm standing there, and people, people were in line. We went to Dick's Sporting Goods, and people were in line at Target for the, for the thingy that was getting ready to happen. Thursday night, and him and I went to Dick's because we had to return another thing, and we like to return stuff. And <laughs> there was a line around Target. And I was like, these people are rushing. I almost wanted to go over to the guy and be like, what are you going to buy? Okay, how much is it? 20 bucks? And you're going to get it for what? 16? All right, here. Here's a few bucks. Go home, you saved your $3. It's not worth five hours to stand in line to save $20. And I'm thinking, and I'm, you know, I'm having this conversation in my mind, and I'm thinking to myself, it's too bad people don't rush for something that has real life. The shepherds, when they heard the good news, watch what they did. They ran to go see Jesus. The first Christmas rush was, G was, was, was over Jesus, not over Nordstrom's. It was over Jesus, and they ran, the Bible says, they rushed to go see him. And when they found him, they worshiped him. Listen, the revolution started before Jesus ever grew up and called Peter or Paul or any of the disciples. The first revolution started, watch this, when God used a bunch of little shepherd boys to come and see his son, that's when the revolution began. Because those shepherds, I guarantee you, for the rest of their life, they talked about that. Remember like when you're young and the old guys were around and you'd be playing basketball or something and they'd be like, I remember when I was young. You ever been around those guys? I got a bad hammy now and I can't do it, but when I was young, well, um, I, I have that moment. Um, I was... Uh, I got a scholarship and played basketball in my junior year in high school to play for a, a place called North State, which was a serious, serious basketball kind of program league, and uh, the huge gym and little classrooms all the way around it. And so I remember go showing up to the school uh, to, to be the point guard, and, and, and man, we practiced and, and got all into it, and we were at the third tournament of the year, and here's the my glory moment. You ready? This is that moment that now I say to my son. 
We were playing basketball the other day, and I said, well, when I was young, I could have jumped right over you. I would have even messed around. And, I, and so I'm, I'm coming down the court, point guard, and I'm bringing the ball down, and there's not much time left on the clock. And so I'm, I look, and I see a lane open right around the forward. I said, oh, man, I'm going to bust around him because they think I'm going to pass the ball, and I'm going to bust around him, and I'm just going to lay it up right there. And here I came, flying. And I, and I, and I saw him. I got around him. I'm like, I'm home free, baby. And I went up to jump, and I looked, and here comes the center. He's coming right at me. I thought, oh, he's going he's to stuff me. So here's what I'll do. I'll just bring the ball down into my left hand while I'm in the air. And I came around on the other side of the basket, and I did one of those things. And yeah, it goes in. Poof, right? Wow that place goes wild. Boom, I land on my, on my leg this way backwards, and I hear a noise and feel it, and I know it's not good, and my knee just goes, boof. And that's my glory moment. I talk about it all the time when I'm with the kids. <laughs> right? I'm like, oh, it was so awesome. And, and my kid's like, well, Dad, how come you're not in the NBA? Because <laughs> I blew my knee out. What do you mean? That's how come I'm not in the NBA. Could you imagine those shepherds for the rest of their lives? Somebody come over to their house for dinner. Hey, did I ever tell you about the time we were hanging out in the field and that angel just popped out of nowhere? And by the way, shepherds were realism guys. They weren't into fantasy and they weren't even religious, so you can trust these guys. They weren't into games. You remember? The angel pops right out and says, don't be afraid. Freaked me out. I almost had a heart attack and died. And I was standing there thinking, what's going on? And he starts to tell me the good news. He starts to tell me about the Savior that would be born. Blew me away. And then the next thing that happened, pow, these angels are singing right above me. It was like a choir. And they're declaring to me that peace is coming and that God loves me. And man, it changed my life. I guarantee you for the rest of their days, they talked about it. They left with a message in their heart that they didn't have hours before. I wrote this down. They came to worship Jesus, and they left with a message that they went, the Bible says, and told everybody about. Now, here's the thing I want to end with. We've got Joseph and Mary. Their lives were revolution, re revolutionized by the birth of Jesus. We've got the angels of God blown away at the, at the beauty of God and what he has done. We've got shepherds that went from being obscure to knowing they're important because God came into their world and, and touched them. And now here's what I want to talk about, what I want to close with, number four, about you and me. How are we going to respond? By the way, I've preached a lot of Christmas messages every year. I told somebody the other day, it's really hard to just come up with something new because the story doesn't change. It's the same story. And we should be caught with wonder and awe again at what Jesus has done for us. When it becomes commonplace for us, this, oh, here we go, it's Christmas. The baby was born and the angels came. <laughs> blah, blah. Then we need a serious, serious revolution in our heart about who Jesus really is. So here's the verse I want to close with. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Listen to this. So Jesus is with his disciples. And when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon answered and said to him, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. When we were in Israel last year, we had a Muslim bus driver... And so we got to go places where normal tours don't get to go because there's Jewish bus drivers, but they don't want to go into certain places because they're afraid. So we got to go into this one place, and I don't remember the name of it, and some Bible scholar here will probably, you know, tell me when it's over, and that's cool. But I did take a picture of it, and it's a stream. And then the, you walk back into these mountains that are like uh, stone walls, like big, big canyons, and then there's little places dug out every now and again. And when you go there, it's where people used to come to worship their false gods and pay homage to their gods. And so they would set up these little idols and they'd set up these things. And they would inscribe things on the wall to their God. And Jesus, they believe, scholars believe that this is where Jesus was when he asked them this question. So they're walking along, right? 
It's a beautiful place. I mean, it's really cool. I have a picture. I'll, maybe I'll show it to you next week. And so they're walking in there, and the disciples are looking at this giant canyon wall with all this inscription and all this stuff and these little cutaways where, you know, they would set up their false gods. And Jesus goes, hey, guys, who, who do you think I am? A good teacher. Jesus was a good man. Oh, let's carve a little spot out on the wall. Put a little thing. Jesus, good teacher. Oh, let's put another little cut. Jesus, a good man. Jesus, good ideas. And Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? Because what are people saying about me? And they're saying, well, they say you're a prophet, you're a teacher, and a good man. And he looks at them. I mean, could you imagine this moment? The Son of God who created all things stares you right in the eyes and says, okay, now who do you think that I am? Who do you say I am? Because who you say he is is the key to everything. Because if you're just a good Christian that comes to church, and you, ah, yeah, I take a little bit of Jesus here and a little bit of Buddha. And, and, you know, I do some horoscopes and I go to psychics. There's a psychic show on TV. It's, I see the commercials for it. And every time it comes on, I go, I can't believe people are buying this stuff. I can't believe that people don't realize that that lady's not tapped into the spirit of God. She's tapped into demonic things. But it looks good because people cry. Oh, my gosh, your dad had a puppy. Woo. His name was Freddie. Ah. And they get all sucked into this stuff, and I'm going, you see, when you declare who Jesus really is, and you say he's the Son of God, and he's who he says he is, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. That's what Jesus said about himself. He didn't say, I'm a way, a truth, a life. He said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And people in that day, Jesus is so narrow-minded. <laughs> Such a bigot hating on all these other religions. No, no. You know what Jesus was? He was filled with love and compassion, and he cared so much that he told the truth. He said often in Scripture, I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. So who is Jesus? Who is he? Because listen, the canyon wall of society, what's in that wall? If it was here today, it'd be this. If you had that big house, you'd be all right. You'd be slamming. Society would love you. Just another car. Oh, this is that sweet. That car, if you had that car, you would be the man. If you had that iPad, that iPhone. And we kind of buy into it a little bit. We actually believe it. I realized the other day, I, I kind of believe that a little bit. Because you get something, people are like, oh. If I pull up in the, the parking lot in a Toyota Corolla, 1988, that's trashed and no paint on it, and I stop, and I get out, because I do this. I look at that person's car and go, wow, can you come on into the 2000s? And you know what? I almost start to judge them a little bit. Like, oh, they, what are they, watch, what are they, just poor? And the Lord's like, oh, you really think that? You really believe? Society has idols all over the place set up, and we kind of we don't think about it much, but we kind of place them there, and our, our hearts are great idol makers. It doesn't take very long, does it? Get a new thing, and it's like, oh. And the Lord's like, enjoy it. Don't love it. Love me. I give you those things as a blessing. Enjoy them. Don't love them. Society, horoscopes are the way. Psychics, this thing. That thing. And Jesus comes into the midst of all that stuff and says to you today, who do you say that I am? Because who you say he is determines the outcome of so many things in your life. I'm not saying you're going to be perfect. As a matter of fact, I say this. Uh, to really follow Jesus, I'll just say what Jesus said. It's narrow and difficult. What? I want the, the grace highway, baby. Life is a highway. Come on. <laughs> Jesus said that the way to him was narrow and difficult. What? That's not what the book told me the other day. I read a Christian book said that it's all good. Just money and stuff. That Jesus just wants to give me money and stuff. 
True, he is good. He will bless you. But he invites you into a journey with him that's a little bit narrow and sometimes can be very difficult. And if anybody's walked with Jesus more than a couple years, you know that that's true. But who you say that he is determines everything about your life from this point on. Why? Why? Because if I believe he's the son of God, I believe he came in the flesh, I believe he died on the cross, I believe he physically rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father, guess what? It changes everything because there's reasons why people don't want to believe in God and they spend money to go out and see if there's you know, aliens out there and they try to disprove everything because they don't want to submit. Because the moment that I say, oh, there's a God and his name is Jesus and he's given us the Bible, guess what happens? I now place myself under the submission of that. But if I say there is no God, there's no such thing as God. The, the, the atheists of America put up a banner. Did you guys see that sign that says basically um, Christianity is a fairy tale. Quit believing in fairy tales. And I said to my son as we were driving down the road, I said, boy, those people spend a lot of money on something they don't believe in, huh? Isn't that crazy? It's not that they don't believe in God. It's just that they're offended at him. They believe in God. They know there's a God. Because in the human heart, they go, there's a God. I was just in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Anybody ever been there? It's beautiful. I was there for 30 minutes. I had to go drop something off and come back. It was terrible. But there's 30 minutes, and I was like, Mount Shasta, woo, white, big trees and water. It was so beautiful. And I said as we were driving back my, to my boy, I said, son, isn't it funny that people want to believe that this just collided with two planets and it all just popped out? It's amazing. They know in their hearts, but they're offended at him. They're offended that God would say, hey, don't do that. Don't, you're going to hurt yourself. See, it's because God loves us that he says, don't commit adultery. It's not because he's a killjoy. It's because he knows that if you commit adultery, your family gets destroyed. And people get hurt and wounded. And he's like, hey, hey, don't do drugs like that and drink like that and party like that. Why? Yeah, because your liver's going to give out on you and you're going to be done. It's out of love. And so they're offended at him, and they say, no, 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 leave Jesus in the bassinet. Leave him there, because he doesn't talk, and he doesn't say anything, and he can't tell me what to do. You see, when we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then our life becomes submitted to him, and he's in charge. And we read his Bible, and we go, ooh, I haven't been doing that very well. Anybody done that lately? Hey, you read the Bible, go, oh, I, didn't, I don't love like I should. And I submit to him and say, Jesus, help me. And the Bible says of him that he is gentle and he is kind. And when he comes back, he's not coming back as a little silky white baby. He's not coming back as a carpenter. And some of you, this will offend you. But Jesus is coming back as the fierce son of God. And I say fierce because I mean it. Read the book of Revelation. There will be no arguing with Jesus. There will be no trying to win the, the political war with him and debate politics and debate issues. You see, Jesus, Jesus came as a savior, not as a politician or as a reformer. He came as a savior because that's what we needed. Most politicians don't, don't, don't revolutionize anything. They just create trouble. And Jesus, watch, he's the most trustable leader on the planet. His, his word is yes, and his word is true. And if we as Christians will submit ourselves to Jesus and say, you are the son of God, and I give my heart to you, watch what happens. Good news fills you. When I used to street witness uh, as a young man every Friday and Saturday night, for like five, six months, nobody's finding Jesus. Nobody's getting saved when I would go out and talk. You know why? Because here's how I started every single conversation with people because I was a little, little bit radical and opinionated. And I, and I said to them, I would start every conversation like this, hey, you know you're going to hell, right? <laughs> and they go, what do you mean? I go, you're listening to Ozzy Osbourne in your car. He, it's satanic, and you're going to hell. And we'd argue for like a half an hour over whether music, that music's of the devil or not. And I'd go up to them, hey, man, you're going to hell. The guy's smoking joint and shooting up. He knows he's going to hell. He said to me, I know. I'm like, wow, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. He disagreed with me. <laughs> Watch. One day I was praying. I said, Lord, I, I, I want people to find you so much. And he says, well, try a different message <laughs> to start out with. Because the angel brought what? Good news of great joy 
to all people. Watch. Then I started going up to people saying, hey, man, how's it going? Cool, cool. Nice car, dude. And I'd talk about their car for like a half hour with them. And then I'd just walk off. Hey, see you, man. Have my Bible. Then I'd come back the next week, and I'd see that same guy. Hey, man, what's up? Oh, ooh, new tires. And then over time, guess what started happening? <clears throat> he started going, hey, there's Rick. And then guess what? Second, third time, I'd be like, what are you doing up here? Why are you holding the Bible? I mean, well, because I'm just up here telling people about the love of God. Just telling people the good news. It's great news, as a matter of fact, that Jesus died for us so that we don't have to live like we're living. And he came to rescue us, and that's what I'm telling people. Oh, cool, man, cool. Next week, go back to him. They know who I am. We start talking pretty soon. They're like, hey, come here. Can I talk to you for a second? I'm like, yeah, come here. They're like, hey, uh, you know, my mom and dad got divorced. And man, I just, I just don't know what to do. And I just, I feel lost. I'm like, oh, good. Because you know what? Feeling lost is a great place to start. Because Jesus, that's what he does. He finds people. He, he knows how to do that. And so why don't you give your heart to him? You want to pray right now? Yeah, man, I need, I, need, I need the Lord. Grab his hands right there in the parking lot. You know, repeat after me. A little prayer. In the name of Jesus, amen. The guy's crying, wiping tears away. See, it's good news. Is it true that if we reject Jesus Christ, we go to hell? Well, that's what Scripture teaches, so I'm going to stick with that. But that's not the starting point. That's not the jumping off place. That's the good news is first. Jesus came to revolutionize our world. And I know this, he's revolutioning my heart every day. My heart's being revived every day when I walk with him because he's changing me. The greatest revolutionary ever to live is Jesus Christ. And I mean, I want to be in his revolution because he's right always. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. <laughs> well, Lord, we thank you for today. Father, it's so good that you, in your wisdom, sent your son to die for us because we had no way to do it ourselves to get to you, and you loved us that much. So I want to pray for every heart that's here today, Father, that even now the arguments in their mind against you would be bound and that they would cease in Jesus' name and that, that, that you would re be revealed to their hearts. I'm just going to go around quickly, starting on the left side of this room, on your left side. If you want to today respond and say, man, I need Jesus in my life. This is good news. I'm forgiven, and he loves me. I'm just going to come through quickly. If that's you, just would you raise your hand up and say, man, I need Jesus in my life. And, I, and, we'll, and we'll just I'll just respond to you. Yeah, good, coming through all the way into the center here. Yeah, good, excellent. Yeah, buddy, good job, yes. Anyone else? Come through I'm all the way on the right here, coming into the middle section. You just say, I need the Lord. Raise it up high, it's kind of hard to see because of the dark. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, yeah. Anybody else? Good. Right where you're sitting, if you raised your hand, would you just pray this to the Lord? Just say this to him. You don't have to yell it out. He knows what you mean. Just, just say, Jesus, come. I believe in you. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died for me. I believe you were buried. I believe you rose again, and you live today. And just say, Jesus, come into my heart. I give my life to you. I surrender. Forgive me my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. He knows what you mean. And before today is out, when this service ends, would you just find somebody and tell them that you gave your life to Jesus today? Would you just say, hey, today I gave my life to the Lord? Because people in here are going to rejoice with you and be happy. That's a good thing. Lord, help us this Christmas season. That it wasn't a silent night. God, angels were singing and angels were proclaiming and shepherds were worshiping and, and then proclaiming as they left you. It wasn't silent, Lord. You broke the silence. And Lord, worship was the first thing that happened when you were born. And I pray that our hearts would be alive with that message and that you would put us in awe of you again. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen? Okay, I want to make a quick, quick announcement. Next weekend, I'm not going to tell you what, but I'm just going to say this to you. You do not want to miss next weekend. That's all I'm going to say. That's, I'm not, and that's just not, that's not a ploy to get you to come. You do not want to miss next weekend. If somebody says, hey, let's go to Napa, you say, Saturday we go to Napa, Sunday I go to church, 
I see the surprise, okay? Let's stand and worship together as we close.